This is Getting to Know Your Bible, a program dedicated to the proclaiming of the good news of Jesus Christ. Here's Billy Lambert. A few days ago, one of our relatives came by and left some pictures at our house. They were pictures that had been taken many, many years ago. And my wife and I sat down, went through those pictures. It was quite an experience. You see, pictures sometimes tell a big story. And that's all you have left of the past is some pictures that have been taken. But what I want to talk about today is about pictures. Four pictures of the gospel. And I want you to stay tuned today as we discuss that Bible theme. Hello, I'm Billy Lambert, and I'm the speaker on Getting to Know Your Bible, and we're delighted to have you watching today, especially if this is the first time that you've seen Getting to Know Your Bible, and we want you to encourage someone else to watch it with you today. Now, on Getting to Know Your Bible, we offer a free Bible correspondence course, and we'd like for all of you to have this course. We've had many, many people that would order, call for the Bible course each week, and in order that you might know more about the Bible course and know how you can receive it, we're going to pause for just a moment. To help you in your study of the Bible, we want to send you this Bible Correspondence Course. This course is non-denominational. It's based on the Bible. It's conducted by mail, and it's free. To receive this course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama, 36580. Or call toll-free 1-877-711-5214. Now what I'd like to do now is to read from the book of Romans, chapter 1, and we're going to start our reading through verse, from verse 14 and read through verse 17. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you there at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. There there are some things I want us to observe about those passages. First of all, there are the three I am's of Paul. He said, first of all, I am a debtor. And he owed so much to so many. He owed so much to the Lord for saving him. And he owed so much to his brethren. And just as Paul was a debtor, so are we. And then secondly, Paul said, I am ready to preach the gospel. And at all times, we should be ready to preach the gospel to all men everywhere. And third, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And never should we be ashamed of the gospel. We should not be ashamed of the Christ of the gospel. We should not be ashamed of the simplicity of the gospel. We should never, ever be ashamed of the gospel. Now Paul says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. In the final analysis of things, It will not matter how popular you may have been. It will not matter how much money you made in the stock market. It it will not matter the type of clothing that you wore. It will not matter the house in which you live. The only thing that's going to matter in the final analysis of your life is what did you do with the gospel of Christ. And it will matter. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven, 
with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that obeyed not the gospel of Christ, who shall be punished with their everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. It won't really be long until all of us are going to be standing before God in the judgment. And the only thing that will matter is what did I do with the gospel. Now when you study the New Testament, you find four pictures of the gospel. Picture number one, the gospel is a news story. The word gospel literally means good news. So the gospel is a new story. In 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, beginning in verse 1, Paul wrote these words about the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, and by which you're saved. If you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he arose again the third day according to the scripture. Paul said, I preach the good news to you. I preach the news to you about Jesus, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, that all mankind might live. Folks, that's good news. Not only is the gospel good news, it is old news. It is as old as the Garden of Eden. It was in the early morning of time that God made a promise in Genesis 3.15 that he was going to do something about the sin dilemma in this world. I put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Thou shalt bruise his head and he shall bruise thy heel. When you want to kill a serpent, you better hit him in the head. You better hit him in the head. And my wife is uh, the queen of killing snakes by hitting him in the head. That's the way you destroy one. And it was in the early morning of time that God promised that he was going to bring a redeemer into this world that would overcome Satan and destroy the works of Satan through the seed of the woman without the seed of the man being involved. Later, the apostle Paul taught in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, And when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. Jesus came into this world through the seed of woman without the seed of man being involved. It's old news. It's also new news because the gospel tells us about a new creature. It tells us about a new law, the gospel of Christ. It tells us about new creatures in Jesus Christ. It tells us about a new heaven. It tells us about a new earth. It tells us about a new way to spend the Lord's day by worshiping him in spirit and in truth. It is new news. But the gospel is universal news. In John the 12th chapter and verse 32, Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. That's universal news. The blessed gospel is for all. But the gospel is not only universal news for all mankind, it is personal news. In Galatians chapter 2 and 20, Paul wrote, For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, that Christ that liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live with the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You could insert your name there. The gospel is personal news. It's a personal thing to me to know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son because I know I'm a part of that. It's personal to me. And the gospel also is the best news you will ever hear. There are a lot of things that we hear that are good news. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if the, 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 the people on the television came on and gave us this report, we have now found a vaccine for COVID-19. That'd be pretty good news, wouldn't it? That'd be great news. But the best news that man has ever heard 
is that Jesus Christ died to save this world from sin. And sin is worse than COVID-19 one million times over. Jesus died to save us from a devil's hell. Folks, that's the best news I've ever heard. So you talk about a picture of the gospel, it's a news story. And the gospel is also a will. If you'll turn in your Bible to Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 15, for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is a force. Listen to it now. After men are dead. Otherwise, it is no strength at all while the testator liveth. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is the last will and testament of our Lord. Now there are three things about a will. It is not a force until the death of the person who made that will. And also there are certain conditions in wills. And then the will will have to be probated. And then the, uh, re the recipients of, of the will will have that uh, announced to them. Now you think about the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's will did not go into effect until he died. Because a testament is not a force until the death of the person who made it. And then there are conditions in the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Peter announced those conditions for the first time on the day of Pentecost recorded in the second chapter of Acts. And, and the, when the people asked what they needed to do to be saved, these were the conditions of the will of Christ that Peter gave to them on that occasion. In the 38th verse of chapter 2, Peter said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so those are the conditions, repentance of sin and baptism for the remission of one's sins. I have a sermon book by a man who now deceased, but in that book he, he is talking about or writing about what Peter did when the people or what Peter said and did when the people asked, what shall we do? This was what he said. Peter told them to repent and believe for the remission of their sins. There's only one thing wrong with that. It just isn't what the Bible teaches. I know the man was a, a good man, no doubt, but, but, but that's not what Peter told them. He told them to repent and to be baptized for the remission of their sins. That was the condition of the will. And you have to obey the conditions of a will to receive the benefit or the blessing from that will. There was a young girl who was going to get married. And her daddy told her, well, if you get married, if you want to receive anything from me when I die, you have, to, you have to be married. It didn't take her long to, to find someone to marry her. A and then the father said, well, not only do you have to be married, but the man that you marry has to be a New Testament Christian. Well, it didn't take her long until that young man was baptized into Christ. F finally, the father died. When the will was read and the conditions were stated in that will as to how the young woman would receive her father's uh, goods and receive an inheritance from him, she had complied with all the conditions in the will. You see, the gospel is a will and that will must be obeyed. In Matthew 7 and 21, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And it is the will of the Father that we believe on his Son. It is the will of the Father that we repent of our sins. 
It is the will of the Father that we confess our faith in Christ. It is the will of the Father that we be baptized for the remission of our sins. It is the will of the Father that we will have faithful, committed, dedicated lives after we're baptized. You see, that's the will. The gospel is a will to be obeyed. But also, the gospel is a way of life. Have you ever thought about the gospel like that? It's a, there's the picture of it, a way of the live. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27, only let your manner of life be as it becomes the gospel. Our lives are to be lived in keeping with the high claims of the gospel of Christ. You, you see, the gospel is a way to live. And we need to live becoming of the gospel. Some things are not very becoming. Sometimes the way people talk is not very becoming of a person. Sometimes the way people dress may not be very becoming. Sometimes when I put on a tie, my wife may look at the tie, then she may look at the suit that I have on, and she said, I just don't think that tie is very becoming of that suit. I, they just don't go together. You see, there are some things that don't go together the way we live our lives. But the gospel tells us how to live our lives. For example, the gospel tells us that we should be honest. That's the way you live your life. The gospel teaches us to be honest. It tells us to let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hand that he may have to give to him that needeth. We're to be honest. The Bible teaches us we ought to be forgiving. In Ephesians 4 verse 32, be kind one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. See, the gospel teaches us how to live our lives. And the gospel teaches us to worship. The gospel teaches us God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The gospel teaches us that we should show love for one another. And there seems to be a shortage of love to go around nowadays. We need to spread the love around. In John 4, 34 and 35, Christ said, A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another even as I have loved you. For by this shall all men know you're my disciples, if you have love one for another. How do people know that you are a Christian? How do people know that you have obeyed the gospel? Is it because you go to the church where they're baptized for the remission of sins? Is it because you go to the church worship service where they do not have instrumental music in the worship service and they just sing? A cappella, like the Bible teaches? Is that how they know that you've obeyed the gospel? Is it because you take the Lord's Supper every Sunday, according to Acts 20 and verse 7? Is that how they know you've obeyed the gospel? Well, for sure, you do those things when you obey the gospel. But the way that people know that you are a Christian is by the way you treat other people. It's by the love you have for one another. It was said of early Christians, in a time when they were being persecuted, see how they love one another. The gospel teaches us how to live our lives. It teaches us to be kind and to, to have love in our heart for other people. Oh, the gospel, not only is a new story, it's not just a will to obey, but the gospel is a way of life. I remember hearing a man teach a lesson one day when I was in chapel when I was in college. And he had been over to England and he said he got the, the, the desire to eat American hamburger while he was there. And he said he asked one of the bobbies there, one of the policemen, where there might be a place he could find one. And he told him about a place called Joe's Place. And he said right before he got to Joe's place, there was a man walking up and down on the sidewalk 
with placards on his the front and on the back, and he was a human sign walking up and down, and the sign read, Eat at Joe's Place, the best food in town. But he said, you know, the man carrying that sign was the best specimen of malnutrition I think I'd ever seen. You see, he wasn't a very good advertisement for that restaurant. And unless we are living as it becomes the gospel, we're not very good advertisements for Jesus. Live as it becomes the gospel. And the gospel tells us how to live. The gospel is a way of life. But I will mention the fourth picture. And the picture of the gospel is that it's the power of God to save. And there is power in the gospel. Go back to what we read earlier in Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Power in the gospel. The Greek word power is the, the word from which we get our English word dynamite. As it were, the gospel is God's domino, so his dynamite. There's power in the gospel, while there's the power of love in the gospel. It's love that draws men to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. I knew a family who lost a son. That son was a boyhood playmate of mine. We played cowboys and Indians and played with footballs and baseballs when we were just little little boys. But he died later but with, with some disease. Until their death, his mother and dad went back to the cemetery, to that son's grave, every day. Every day they went back to it. Let me ask you what drew them back to the cemetery. Love brought them back there. And you say, well, I don't think that's wise. That's beside the point whether it was wise or not. It was their love for a son that they had lost that drew them. And that which will draw men to Christ is the power of love there is in the gospel. And there is that power in the gospel. Really, there's the power of fear in the gospel as well. You know, Jesus said, don't fear those that are able to destroy the body but don't have any power over the soul, but fear those who are able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. The gospel is great power, and the gospel can take a man who's been living in sin or a woman who's been living in sin, and now their bodies are ravaged with sin. The, the strain of sin shows in their uh, complexion and their face, but they become Christians. They give their life to Christ. And I have seen the power of the gospel change a town drunk into a child of God who never dropped, uh, took, no, to, took another drop of liquor. That's the power of the gospel. And there is power in it. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, 18 said, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. But he says, For the gospel is a power that saves a world. The world is saved by the gospel. You ask me, what does our world need today? The thing the world is in need of, not just in America, but in every country throughout the world, they need the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be lifting up the gospel of Christ. And if you've never obeyed the gospel, I'd urge you to do that today. There's a power of the gospel there's power in the gospel to save your soul. You say, well, I've been a bad person. I had a man tell me one day, I've done so many bad things, I don't believe the Lord could save me. I said, you are the kind of person the Lord came to save. Jesus said, don't fear, he said that those that are righteous don't need a doctor. It's those that are sick that need a doctor. And Jesus is the doctor who never lost a case. Jesus is the great physician. Jesus Christ wants to save your soul. I want you to think about, in, in our closing moments today, the cross of Christ. 
Think about it. Try to visualize Jesus, if you can, upon that cross. And Jesus has his arms extended on that cross. He's nailed to that old rugged cross. There are nails in his feet. And I want you to picture Jesus there. But think about this. Think about Jesus as it were extending a hand down to you. And then he wants you to put your hand in his hand. He wants to save you. There are husbands watching this. Wives watching this. Maybe there are some of their teenage children watching this. You need Christ in your life. Would you not become a child of God today? If we can assist you in your baptism into Christ, why don't you contact us and let us know which you get you in touch, in touch with someone who will assist you in that matter. I want to thank you for watching today, and in closing, may I invite you to visit the Church of Christ in your community, and also pick up the telephone right now. Call for the free Bible correspondence course. We've had thousands of people that are doing that. Please do it right now. And I want to thank you for watching. Tell someone else about getting to know your Bible, and we'll be looking for you next time. Until we meet again, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you is my prayer. We want to help you as much as possible in your search for a personal relationship with God. You can now easily access our free Bible correspondence course online at gettingtoknowyourbible.com. If there's any way we can help you grow closer to God, please email us at gettingtoknowyourbible at yahoo.com or call us anytime at 1-877-711-5214. Getting to Know Your Bible has been presented by Churches of Christ. If you have a question about the church, or if you would like the location of a Church of Christ near you, or to receive the free Bible course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama 36580, or call 1-877-711-5214. Join us next time for Getting to Know Your Bible.